Hello and welcome to this AIM webinar. I'm Mike Ellen, the Member Engagement Manager for AIM. AIM is a global industry alliance which represents the interest of everyone using barcoding, RFID, and related data capture technologies, including manufacturers, software vendors, integrators, governments, and end users. Before we get started, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, as you probably noticed, you are muted. Also, if you have a webcam, please turn that off before the start of the presentation. You will stay muted throughout the presentation, but if you do have questions, you can send them via the chat option that you can access at the bottom of the screen. Send your questions to AIM member services and we will answer as many as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Today we will be discussing frequency bands in Europe, the milestones and important next steps. Our presenters today are Joseph Breisuber Flugel, the EVP CTO of CIS Semiconductor GmbH, and Steve Halliday, the president of the RAIN RFID Alliance. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, this is Joseph Breisuber speaking. I am CTO of CIS Semiconductor. <clears throat> today I'm representing here uh, in respect to my role in Etsy, so I'm the vice chairman in Etsy TG34 RFID. And um, this is a group that is basically one of the Etsy groups here uh, in the ERM, in the radio meter spectrum. And inside this group, we have TG34 RFID that takes care primarily about the UHF RFID. Inside this group, I'm also the rapporteur of EN0228. This is one of the, or this is the standard for UHF RFID regulations for Europe. And today I would like to tell you a little bit more what's currently ongoing here and what challenges we see in this environment. So UHF RFID in Europe, uh, I think you're all aware, we have uh, a band from 865 to 868 megahertz with two watts for the readers, 10 micro, 10 micro watts for the tags, with four transmit channels, which are all 200 kilohertz and have a spacing for 600 kilohertz. It's guess it's nearly 10 years ago, it, it, we started something uh, that we get more and I call say double it because uh, we are talking now about the so-called upper band, which is from 915 uh, to 921 megahertz. And this actually has four watts. This means twice the power for the reader. This results in a range increase of more than 40%. We have transmit channels with 400 kilohertz. So this means we can use twice the speed when communicating from the reader to the tag and we have a channel spacing of 1,200 kilohertz. This means we can use twice the speed when doing the communication from the tag back to the reader. So overall, this means uh, <clears throat> twice the speed, 30% more on range, and sometimes not really seen by many people. We have also 100 microwatts for the tag, so the power for the tag also increased significantly, so the tech spectrum is no longer that challenge than it is for the lower band. This was when we started the activity. Uh, later on, we figured out that our four channel plan is really a cool approach. However, uh, due to other band users, we finally um, had to squeeze into a three channel. So the fourth channel, we had to give away primarily for the railways. So this was a conclusion that applies uh, for the European Union. So for European Union members, uh, this is not necessarily all Europe. So in Europe, there are also non-EU countries, but many countries uh, outside European Union follow this. Um, <clears throat> so what we have here now in these um, activities, we have uh, basically three categories of documents that we need. The, one, the most important is actually the CPT recommendation 703. This recommendation applies to 46 countries. So this means this is really the whole Europe, including all uh, non-EU members and yeah, really countries also going to the very east of, of Europe. 
like Russia, Georgia, and those places. And this document has been released and approved uh, and published in June 2019, very nicely defining uh, the four channels uh, for um, uh, communication for our UHF RFID from the 9, 15 to 921 megahertz, actually saying it's three channels uh, for European Union members, according to decision, and a fourth channel might be used by other countries as well. Uh, the EU decision then applies for 28 members. This document uh, has been done already a while ago. I come back to this. And we have the RED, the Radio Equipment Directive, uh, which is new since 2014. And basically, and then this implementation 2017, and basically then says, okay, if you have for that particular product for Europe, uh, you have to follow on harmonized standards. And the very important one for UHF RFID is EN0228. What about the schedule? Um, we had the EC decision, the squeeze plan in, in October 2018, so roughly a year ago. We had the very short deadline for the implementation. De facto member states are late. However, the whole thing is moving. Uh, we had this June revision of 70, uh, CPD recommendation 703. This is done. However, we have uh, the issue here now on the ENCU228. We are, we, I would like to go into more details later. So, Steve, could you probably talk about what's ongoing here in respect to the EC, uh, EC decision? Because the RAIN Alliance here is helping us dramatically to move this topic forward. Yes, thanks, Joe. Um, this is Steve Halliday. I'm the president of the RAIN RFID Alliance. Uh, we've been involved in, in the work in the EU for some time now, helping to define the squeeze plan, and now we're helping to try and get implementation as quickly as possible. So the EC made a decision back in February that um, the three-channel plan should be followed. Uh, and what we find amongst the EU member states is, is as shown on the screen here. So 10 have already adopted it. 11 have confirmed that they will adopt it. So that, that sounds like a great number and things are moving forward. Unfortunately, we have some um, slight hiccups up on the way. We've got three countries that are still investigating whether they're going to implement. We have two countries that can only implement the two lower channels. Um, this is because they have already assigned the upper channels to somebody else. And we have two countries that do not allow it, Netherlands and Germany. So, uh, Next slide, Joe, please. So we have taken action to, to work with Germany to try and work out a plan to help them move forward. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a meeting with um, members of the Federal Ministry of Economics and Energy in Germany. Um, and what we want to do is we want to take as many letters from German-based companies as we can with us to this meeting. The goal here is to get as many manufacturers, solution providers, and end users of RAIN technology uh, to send the letter to me so that we can take them with us when we go to this meeting and show the massive support. RAIN sent out a request to its members um, some while back to do this, but we still have time and if there's anybody here on the call who would like to send a letter from their German office, they don't have to be um, only a German company. It could be a German office of a, a company from another country. It could be end users. Um, we would love for you to do that. You can send me an email at steve at rainrfid.org and I will send you the draft template. You can take the letter, add your company letterhead, um, make changes if you want to sign it and send it back to me and we will include it in the package of letters that we're going to deliver to the ministry in Germany. After we've worked on Germany, we will then look at the Netherlands and see how we can help to make them make a decision to implement the new frequencies. 
Okay, Joe, thanks. Good, thank you, Steve. Uh, I guess you also wanted to mention that it first indications whether you could support it should be done this week. Uh, mm -hmm. And then because the schedule is somehow, yeah, thank we you, get Joe. to the end. Yes, thanks, Joe. I forgot to say that. Um, I would really like to hear from you before the end of this week so that we can move forward as fast as possible. Our plan was to meet with the ministry in December. Thanks. Good. So um, what Steve was talking about, this is basically the very good part of the European Commission that uh, they support us a lot with the squeeze plan. They support us a lot um, in respect to uh, getting a solution here. Even uh, it was the European Com Com Commission that really was supportive talking to us on how to approach those countries that are slow in adoption. So the commission pushes them. They also told us who or how or what to do in respect to Germany. At least they gave some indications. This was the good part. Now the more challenging part comes, which is the EN0228 issue. Uh, actually, in January 2019, the document was completed. It was sent out for ballot. I mean, we, I'm doing standardization for 20 years. I noticed you get feedback, comments, and so on. But suddenly, we got the information that the EEC, together with the company Ernest & Young, um, does a legal review of harmonized standards. And this uh, legal review we received in May. Uh, it looked pretty, yeah, it was, some effort, but it was something we could uh, resolve and was done in June. Uh, in August, we got a new feedback from the commission. We did a complete document in September. And in October, yeah, we basically said, okay, that's it. We conclude this. Uh, could you have a look on it before we move it forward for formal ballot? It was the feedback, yes, that's it. Uh, but we have new things to consider. And um, I did this presentation originally two weeks ago in, in Darmstadt at the RFD Tomorrow event. And it says, okay, October 2019, there's a chance to be approved this because we had a meeting at the end of October. But uh, no, we could not. The target is moving, so we are working on this. And V means really, I guess we have probably 100 participants or 150 registrations for this webinar. It's a group of six people who really try to resolve this issue. And uh, this is something we can do, but there is also some risk involved, I would say. Good, so the current plan is still that we have a draft available in December. Then uh, we get uh, in spring, is a reasonable chance that it gets published and in fall then that we get the member states implementation. So, sorry, I had this animation. Good, um, so what is the issue? Uh, the issue is that de facto there was no publication of harmonized standards in 2019. This means ETSI, this means SENSE. And the reason is that the commission is far more too cautious because in a completely different area, it was in construction engineering, uh, the EU Commission was uh, brought uh, basically to court because somebody built um, a, um, a building according an EN standard and the building more or less fell down. And the construction company uh, went to court against the European Commission and the Commission failed. So. For that reason, in all the end standards, they are now involving uh, legals. And uh, this is a significant issue. It is not only our group, this is impacting many other groups. So the Etsy um, high level groups are already addressing this. And there's a good chance that this topic uh, may move forward uh, to the highest uh, European Commission level because it is definitely seen as a significant disadvantage for the European economy. So I don't know where these lines come from. <laughs> Good. Um, so um, in order to address the topics of the European Commission, we had to uh, introduce uh, new tests 
in uh, ENCO228 and um, these new tests are about uh, the channel use. Certainly it's three channels in Europe, it's four channels for CPD and non-European union members. We have uh, more tests on receiver frequent, radio frequency intermodulation, um, more um, on extreme conditions, co-channel rejection. So these are all tests that could be easily derived from previous uh, tests. Uh, certainly they need more effort, more testing on more temperatures, on voltages is certainly a topic. And we also have the topic of receiver sensitivity. And yeah, we got sweating about this one because this is currently really um, a big challenge because uh, we have gate readers, uh, portal readers, uh, which are really very sensitive devices. So we talk minus 70 or something like this, but we also have printer devices and they are not built for range, long range, but still there has to be tests in there and they probably have minus 10 dB sensitivity or something like that. And uh, in order to define these tests, this is currently the topping we have the highest tension on uh, because we can't set very easy uh, limits because then the commission will throw it back and say, okay, with these limits, uh, you can move forward. But if you put in very tough limits, uh, products would fall out and even product categories would fall out because a printer, reader, has completely different parameters than a reader used for a portal. So this is what we're currently working on, where we also need then the argumentation towards the European Commission for the legal review, why certain values have been selected. Good, um, what we have here is actually two things in respect to reader uh, receiver sensitivity and tech backscatter. We have the Etsy standard and Luckily, we also have an ISO standard um, handling this. So the ETSI standard as it currently is, without this sensitivity test, is about radio regulations topics and the ISO standard certainly is about uh, tech performance or in, in respect to system performance. Um, the difference here is that in ETSI, we follow one band. So from the tech side, uh, there's one side band of the tech which could interfere with a short range device like a fire alarm. And this is important that this power, what is uh, transmitted by the tag is measured. And then uh, is basically considered uh, in respect to the interference with other applications. These tests exist maybe for 15 years already. And now we have the reader sensitivity part, but here, actually both side bands should be taken into consideration because the backscatter is really uh, getting uh, from the tag to the reader on both side bands and both side bands can be combined and the advantage here is a uh, level of 3 dB. Good, so what we have here, so the original topic is, uh, yeah, there's some discrepancy here on reporting this. At this time, uh, most, uh, values shown uh, according to the SSU 228 for the tech backscatter, but there's nothing on the read, uh, reader sensitivity. This has been introduced in the ISO case with dual sidebands, and the difference here is basically um, 3 dB. And in Etsy, it might end up that we have to consider both methods, single sideband one for interference and the double sideband one for um, performance or reader sensitivity analysis. And this is currently a discussion we have ongoing. Um, and the key topic here is really to have something defined that can be traceable, globally reproducible. It's tested with independence, certainly, uh, meaningful in terms of physics, and that we have this available and we can then really handle this. Good. Um, Topics that pop up here is uh, the power of and the backscatter power. So, so on a technical side, what you see here in, in, in this uh, slide here is that we have signals with complete different backscatter power. Uh, one is, uh, sorry, uh, with complete different um, carrier power depending on the reflection of the system. 
but the backscatter power is the same for both cases. And it's important here uh, in this step method really to ensure that the carrier that has no meaning for either interference because it's anyway in the transmit channel and also not for sensitivity because it is not relevant for the reader. It's even disturbing the reader is not uh, considered in this measurement. Good. Um, to conclude, uh, what we have here ongoing here is the European Commission requests new tests for RAIN readers. Luckily, it's only for readers. There's nothing about the text. We have the EC requirements uh, as a moving target for harmonized standards. So this means uh, on October 15, during the TG34 meeting, uh, we received, or I mean, we heard already, but basically it was clear we need, we have new requirements and we have to implement tests. And, um, and therefore this makes the current schedule uncertain. Luckily, we have everything in place uh, for the lower band for a while. Uh, for the upper band, there is already uh, something else there. But uh, the next version of the harmonious standard that the European Commission is pushing for is not yet available. Uh, this is one part. Um, the other topic is the member states need a push. So what Steve mentioned already, uh, that RAIN helps you a lot, so RAIN and AIM Europe and AIM Germany. And uh, so any indications on whether you could draft a letter of support should be sent back to Steve by the end of uh, this week. I mean, if it takes a, for a few more days in order to get all the signatures from the corporate officers, this can be handled then and sorted out what the schedule means but that's the topic. So then band use for the upper band basically currently requires a notified body. And uh, the very important thing is that performance parameters of RFID technology are getting now a regulatory requirements. So we have to be really good neighbors and have to have neighbor friendly devices uh, this is what the commission pushes a lot. So very clear spectrum is limited by physics. And in order to be able to put as many applications as possible into this, they are really pushing for quality in the devices, good performance of the devices that we don't interfere with others. I guess this is good, well solved, but that others also don't disturb us. And that's the reason why they're looking for really good parameters and yeah we are working on it and honestly uh, in the good old days we had 50 people or 30, 40 people in Etsy meeting sitting last time we were six the week before that meeting before we were eight people and uh, also what I talked in RFD tomorrow two weeks ago this is we are doing really hard work here we have really good people in this group, but we are only a handful. And it's not clear whether we could miss something which is important for the industry. And in one year when the standard is published or next year when the standard is published, somebody raises the point and say, oh, why didn't you consider this? Well, we considered everything we knew, but it's not clear whether we know everything. So you're really Highly appreciated uh, or highly welcome to join also the Etsy group again. Um, uh, there's a next meeting next week already by telecom uh, in order to provide also your inputs because this could help really to make the standard good. To get it out in a high quality again, to basically solve all the challenges we get from the European Commission. And it would be really good to do it right now because we don't know before next revision what new challenges will come up and it's better to have a really stable document uh, published next year uh, and we don't get into this that what happened in other standards that for the red transmission uh, transformation the standards got published and people recognized that the kund no longer can really uh, certify products because something was missed and the text cost issues for particular applications. 
Good. That's it um, from my side. Also, with yeah, I hope to motivate the experts here to join again the Etsy group where we discuss all this. And if there are any questions, please go ahead now and let me check my chat window. All right, Joseph and Steve, thank you for your information today. I do have a few questions I'll ask here. Um, and there's still time to ask questions. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat option icon. If you just chat the question to me, I can send that to you. Uh, first question I have is, will, oh, can you please elaborate on the reasons why Germany is not willing to apply the new bans? Um, yes, Germany uh, allocated the ban from 915 to 921 megahertz many years ago to the military. And so it's owned so to say owned by the military and the military gave uh, the 918 to 921 megahertz subband of it to railways. And uh, this is currently the status and the German government, I would say this way, needs some motivation to change because if nobody raises the voice, there's no reason to change. That's the reason why AIM uh, Rain and AIM collect those letters to tell them that there is an, a need or a good reason to change. And until now, they officially don't know this. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question we have is, will it be possible for a single reader to transmit on both upper and lower bands simultaneously? I think yes. but I need to double check. Okay. And another question we have, is the UK part of the countries that have adopted, implemented the new bands? Steve, do you know? Uh, I have to go back and look, but I believe the UK is, uh, has said that they will adopt, but they, at this point they have not. Another question we have, in case countries like Germany still block such applications, would it remain possible to request derogations for indoor and specific applications? Yes, I think what this is refers to is a so-called site license. So site license uh, usually always possible. Therefore, yes. I mean, and we had a site you, license for, for basically doing the tests in, inside the Etsy work. Okay, I apologize for jumping in there. Can you clarify the need for notified body for band use? Um, yes, because there's no published EN standard. You basically need to go to somebody who has appropriate expertise, which is a notified body. And they basically do a re, uh, research what is available on the markets, in the community, whatever, uh, as an expert opinion on testing. And they basically refer back to the draft EN0228 and then could say, okay, this is the best you can do in order to certify your product. Because the reason is because if a member state adopts the band, then you can basically use the ban. But if there's no harmonized standard for certification, then they go back to what is the best technical knowledge. And this is something you cannot do yourself. Okay, thank you. LF and HF RF bands are mostly standardized and used equally country to country. Uh, is the variation with UHF due to it being newer, or is that something else? Um, LFHF, uh, more or less standardized globally. For UHF, there is basically one standard for Europe, one standard for the US. And yeah, the reason is that these uh, UHF bands have been uh, allocated to different uh, applications uh, many years ago. Uh, for instance, the US uh, used different uh, frequencies for mobile 
phones than uh, Europe. And as a result, there are only certain gaps left in between. And for that reason, we more or less had to find gaps for UHF RFID. I mean, we are working strongly on this harmonization uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, for instance, Japan moved already uh, into the 916 to 924 megahertz band. So having said this, all, or I think all countries of the world either have something between 900 and 930 megahertz available or between 865 and 868. Okay, great. And then going along with that, can you explain how FCC and Etsy make their regulations and are there significant differences in their processes? Um, I'm sorry, I have no idea how FCC is doing this. So I cannot answer this because I don't know how FCC is doing this. I can briefly tell you what Etsy is doing. Etsy basically uh, has the mandates from the European Commission from CPT to develop test standards and inside Etsy particular groups are set up um, and then participation in this group is by company organization and uh, so this is basically then those experts who develop the standards always participating are the regulatory representatives from the various countries uh, and then in the ballots, uh, there are two groups of uh, voting members. There is basically the industry and there are the national bodies or the regulatory representatives of certain countries, of all countries. Okay, thank you. A uh, question we have is about measuring backscattered power from the TAD. 302208 refers to specific TAG chip commands, continuous retromodulation, for example, do not exist at the time being in most common tag chips. In such a case, how can, follow, how can you follow RAD test suite for certification? Yeah, um, the, the reason for this is a little bit different because uh, EN0228 um, is basically uh, a standard for everything which falls under this category. And uh, when the standard was developed, it was very obvious that ISO 10063 slash 102 slash RAIN RFID is the most uh, prominent uh, technology used. For that reason, there's a test procedure defined uh, that you can use the PLF, or basically a regular tech communication, reader to tech communication. And uh, it has a, a PLF around uh, frequency around 300 kilohertz. We all know that PLF is 320 and we have some tolerance on this one. I think it's plus minus 10%. Um, and um, so this couldn't be used in that way. Uh, certainly in order to have representative data, you go for EPC. However, the ETSI standard cannot uh, lock in for a certain technology only. Uh, so this means, for instance, if you want to test an 18,061, 64, or uh, proprietary solution that does not support any of those commands, you also have to offer a test option that can be used. And for that reason, there is the second option in that you have a um, permanent signal with 300 kilohertz. Okay. And who is so, responsible for compliance of the tag backscatter requirements? The chip manufacturing, inlay manufacturing, or reader, or all three? Um, who is responsible that uh, the tech spectrum, tech backscatter requirements are fulfilled is the person that brings this into the European Union and puts the CE mark on it because it's part of the CE mark. And what is the most recent draft version of the EN standard and where is it available? So, it is available on the uh, Etsy web page, so uh, Etsy.org. Then you can do a search. Um, 
according to the standard number, and then you get probably 3.1.0. And all current updates are not published, uh, and they are only accessible for Etsy members. And the reason is clear, it's currently a moving document and sending an interim version out does only make sense for those people who participate in the current work. And could you explain why backscattered signal is so controlled since it's very low power and could only corrupt very short ranges uh, and applications? My backscattered power is so low yeah, I think this is this is part of the of the of the passive RFID technology. Um, Steve, do you have some tutorials on this one? In uh, yeah, in I think the, the question was was more why are they so worried about the backscatter backscatter um, signal when it's so low that it's not able to interfere? And, and I don't have an answer for that one. I have an answer. Okay, <laughs> um, the point is that uh, the backscatter signal is very low. But short range devices uh, do communication over longer distances at very low power. So they probably have only 1% or less of the transmit power of an RFID reader and uh, want to transmit uh, 10, 50, 100 meter. And this means the power that from a short range device like a fire alarm shows up at the other, at the receiver is in the same range uh, as from a passive RFID tag. I think Joe, you raise a good point here in that um, we need to remember that, that we are only one user of the band. And although RFID is being given special consideration and allowed to transmit at much higher powers than most of the other users in the band, we, we still have to be a good neighbor and we still have to obey the rules, being aware of the fact that other people are using the band. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and another question we received was if someone could take a moment to talk about the uncommon frequency ranges in Brazil. I, I guess this, this is a, a something that I, I don't have the knowledge of what the frequency ranges in Brazil are. Um, there are places around the world that use different frequencies, um, different from where most of them. When we first started this work many, many years ago, we designed the system to work over a range of um, 860 to 960 megahertz because it seemed that all RFID working in the UHF band fell into that range. Today, as Joe said, that range has become much shorter and really we're only looking at two bands of um, frequency that, that rain operates in. Not quite sure where, where Brazil works. I know where Brazil works. It works in the 902 to 928 megahertz band. However, there is a gap in it. Uh, I don't know where the gap is. Probably it's between 910 and 915, which is not available for RFID, but on the GS1 web page, there's an overview about this. So if you don't uh, find it, you can send me an email or then I can help you out. Okay. And I guess the general but last question email we have, is we have a uh, slide here and then you can, that just gives you the general information of everyone on the call here. Um, it's just why are governments not agreeing to a single UHF band for RFID? I think Joe probably already answered that one, and that's the fact that um, at the time UHF RFID started to become popular, the bands had already been allocated for other work. Um, and, and as Joe said, GSM was the big user of a lot of the band, and Europe was different from uh, the Americas. And we just have to fit in around what's already there. Um, RFID is never going to win a battle against the telecoms provider. Okay. 
Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank both Joseph and Steve uh, for your insights today. I'd also like to thank our active audience for their participation on today's call. Very much appreciated, and uh, thank you, and have a great Mike, rest of your Mike, day. Mike, can I say one last thing, and that's to remind everyone, if you have a German office and you could provide us with a letter, please contact me as soon as possible so that I can get you the packet and we can get the stuff included as we go to the, the German government in December. Thank you. Okay, thank you from my side, and have a good day. Thank you. Bye, yes, thank you, everyone. And the presentation will be made available shortly, and I will email uh, all the people who registered uh, for the webinar here today. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.